The knowledge derived from mystical states underwrites practically all of the fundamental truths of the world's religions. From the vision of the angel Jabril to the prophet Muhammad, the experience of Nirvana under the Bodhi tree, the vision serpent met in the bloodletting rituals of the Maya, the tiered heavens of the Gnostics, the experience of fundamental oneness in the Upanishads and in Parmenides, the experience of encountering pure mind in the Hermetic religious philosophy, the revealing of the Book of the Law to Aleister Crowley in Egypt, to the birth of the Son and the Soul of Meister Eckhart, are the fundamental unity of the Sufis, and on and on and on. Ecstatic mystical experiences again and again appear as perhaps the fundamental datum of religion, spirituality, and religious philosophy. For millions, indeed billions of people around the world, these experiences are taken to be a fundamentally true and foundational cornerstone of almost every aspect of their lives. The experiences of mystics even thousands of years after their deaths deeply shape the everyday lives of people from the cradle to the grave. But how often do we subject the category of mystical experience itself, especially the knowledge said to be gained in just such experiences, to rigorous philosophical analysis? Rejecting both simple credulity and pseudoscientific dismissal of such states as, well, basically delusions, I want to see just how far philosophy can take us in understanding, critically appraising, and appreciating the knowledge said to have been gained in mystical states. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. As some of you know, my academic background is in both religious studies and in philosophy, and my day job is mostly teaching philosophy. Sadly, I don't get to explore philosophical issues relating to esotericism much in my day job. Well, sadly for me, but good for the channel because I do get to explore them thanks to the support I get for the channel. In this episode, I want to unpack just what we might be able to say, philosophically at least, about the knowledge gained from mystical states by dialoguing with a chapter of Richard Jones's really wonderful volume, Philosophy of Mysticism. I'll give some more recommendations on this topic later in the episode if the intersection of philosophy, mysticism, and esotericism interests you. The best place to begin our exploration is with William James's seminal 1902, The Variety of Religious Experience, where he notes four key elements of mystical experience. Ineffability, that is to say that the mystical experience itself is incapable of being robustly articulated in discursive or propositional forms. A noetic quality, that is one is said to gain knowledge from the mystical experience that they are transient, the mystical experience doesn't last very long, and they don't seem to occur according to a pattern. And lastly, passivity, that the experience is often so overwhelming that one is subject to it rather than actively feeling in control. Of course, there are other characteristics of mystical experiences, and perhaps not all such experiences conform to James's typology, but this is as good a place as any to get started. The specific aspect I want to focus in on this episode is that of the noetic quality. That is, that one is said to gain knowledge from the mystical experience. Oh, yeah. What do I mean by mystical? 
well, this is just, just a huge ball of wax. So I'm just gonna put forward a rough and ready preliminary definition as something like uh, an immediate experience of ultimate reality. Many religions and private individuals are said to undergo mystical experiences from which they derive scriptures, philosophical teachings, and other alleged truths about reality, human nature, even scientific discoveries like the structure of the benzene molecule, and so on. Of course, the experience itself, like all experiences, remains basically a black box. Which is just to say that no one can really have access to anyone else's experience. Whether that's via angel scrying, your visions brought on via ayahuasca, or just the feeling of the sunshine on your face while you, I don't eat ice cream. But once an experience is said to have been had or produced knowledge, which you can convey to the rest of us, philosophy can at that point begin to do what it does. It can begin to ask questions. And those central questions here for this episode are four. One, are there grounds for accepting or rejecting the knowledge derived from mystical states? And are such experiences veridical? Two, can mystical experiences count as evidence for specific sets of doctoral claims, especially those that can't be otherwise investigated? Three, are mystics justified in accepting their own experiences as veridical and for supporting their own doctrinal claims? And four, are non-mystics justified in accepting the experiences of mystics and supporting other doctrinal claims? Let's explore each of these questions in turn. Now, the first question you might raise is, how can a non-mystic evaluate the experiences had by mystics? Well, the simple answer here is that, that they can't because of the experiences being black boxes, like I mentioned earlier. But non-mystics are people doing philosophy from a non-mystical viewpoint can evaluate the epistemological and propositional claims made by mystics. Beyond being just a feeling, mystical experiences are very often interpreted by the mystics themselves and are cashed out in propositional form. For instance, about ethics, what you should and shouldn't do, or metaphysics, what is the fundamental structure of reality. Those propositions and the epistemology claimed by the mystics can and should be philosophically investigated by non-mystics. Indeed, I see it as an obligation on the part of philosophy to be as critical and sympathetic as possible to such experiences for two reasons. One, they touch on fundamental areas of philosophical analysis, and two, they have such an enormous social and historical impact. Just writing off experiences of mystics by philosophers and scientists is as arrogant and short-sighted as it is, well, unphilosophical and unscientific. The key issue is that the mystics claim to gain knowledge from such experiences. Indeed, most classical mystics are simply unequivocal on this point. Their experience has provided them knowledge that is fundamentally, eternally true. Not true for them, their religion or philosophy, but true for all people at all times. And this produces our first dilemma, the problem of inconsistent mystical revelation. If all mystics all over the world at all times produce the same series of propositions as a result of their experiences, that would pretty much settle the matter. They could all be trusted. But that isn't what happens. Such propositions vary widely from mystic to mystic, even within religious traditions. Indeed, such propositions very often stand in logical contradiction with one another. From a logical point of view, radical dualism and radical monism are not compatible metaphysically, but both have been forwarded by various mystics through time. Now, we typically settle such a problem of competing truth claims by subjecting them to various experimental or logical testing via a neutral third party. Obviously, that's 
That's not possible here. They're having mystical revelations. The experience of the mystic is idiosyncratic. It's quasi ineffable and it's transient as mentioned by James earlier. It just doesn't lend itself to either form of testing, at least not longitudinal repeated testing under controlled conditions. Now, there are a few options at this point to deal with this problem. You could just reject that the propositions made by mystics should be evaluated with logic at all. Of course, at that point, you kind of just get off the philosophy train, which is fine. Though, oddly, you also have to ignore all those parts where the mystics clearly state that they are telling us truths. Capital T, truths. If some things are true, then other things aren't, by definition. If you want proof of this, look at how much mystics, this is from Christians to Buddhists, have historically argued with one another over just that point. Which mystical insights are true and which ones aren't. You can reject logic to solve the problem, really just ignore it, but just note that the mystics themselves aren't really going along with that option with you. This is a bit like claiming that you know better than the mystics, which is kind of odd considering that you're going to them to learn stuff and you're also still doing logic despite you saying that you're getting off team logic. Whatever. Another solution is to claim that the fundamental mystical experience is the same for all mystics, but that the interpretations of those experiences vary because they're always already occurring in a specific culture, religious, historical setting, etc. And thus the inconsistency has to do with the theater of interpretation rather than the experience itself. The problem here is that, again, this is claiming to know better than the mystics who very often subject their own mystical experiences for verification by relying on just those cultural, historical, and religious touchstones that you just rejected. If most mystics are anchoring the truth of their claims within that cultural, historical, or religious setting, it just seems inappropriate or wrong to remove them from those contexts. It may be even destructive of the truth value of the very mystical propositions themselves. Further, insofar as classical mystics locate the truth of their mystical claims in those specific contexts, by removing them, one is basically saying that the specifically Christian, Islamic, Buddhist, Maya, indigenous, etc. aspects of their experiences are basically false, or at least fundamentally inconsequential. If the world's historical mystics have to have their propositions surgically amputated from their context to be true, then by what criteria are we making that excision, given that the primary experience itself was non-fungible and unknowable by the person doing the excising? And it's just ironic that the very mechanism the historical mystics use to vet and underwrite the truth of their own experiences turns out to be basically wrong for most, maybe all, historical mystics. You can imagine the shock and justifiable indignation of a medieval Kabbalist being told by a modern person that say, the tree of life emanationism theory is great, but you know, all that being Jewish and rigorously living according to the Jewish law is just, that's just parochial fluff. We can cut all that out. There's just something paradoxical about going to learn from historical mystics, these fundamental truths, and then basically claiming to know better than them as one cherry picks just those truths with no real rhyme or reason so far as I can tell. Now, does any of that fundamentally undermine the noetic quality of the mystical experience? No, not at all, despite what some scientists and philosophers may assert. The fundamental mystical experience itself may well be noetic and the contradictions may be merely apparent. Now, that doesn't mean that this is going to be easy going, 
But let's keep digging. Let's tackle the question of the veridicality of the experience itself. There are basically two philosophical means available to us at this point. Some type of rationalism or some type of empiricism or perhaps some combination of the two. Rationalism just isn't going to get us very far because experiences just aren't explicable in those terms. My experience of talking into a camera right now or eating an apple like I did earlier isn't rational or irrational. It's basically non-rational in that such categories just don't apply. Typically we say that propositions are said to be rational and experiences just aren't propositions or even beliefs. So this really isn't going to help much. Empiricism, however, curiously might help here. As you probably know, empiricism deals with sensation and the trustworthiness of the information that we get from those sensations. For instance, I take it as veridical that I am currently talking into a camera based on the sensations that I'm currently having. It's just rather common sense, ultimately. Obviously, mystical experiences very often have this kind of empirical quality, though with some important caveats. One, while such experiences often appeal to sensation-like language like sight or hearing, the principle of ineffability often means that these appeals are often metaphorical in nature, though literal seeing and literal hearing in mystical experiences isn't that common. Second, as we mentioned earlier, the experiences themselves are often verified or interpreted by appeals to other sacred authorities that themselves aren't empirically verified. For instance, when Hildegard of Bingen anchors the truth of her experience in the Bible or Catholic authorities, we aren't dealing with sensation any longer, but a kind of appeal to sacred authority. Thirdly, one of the things we can expect out of empirical claims is third-party verification. If we were on a walk together and I see a UFO land in front of us, the first thing I'm going to ask you is, what are you currently seeing? And then kind of go from there. Hopefully you see it too, though that only solves the one problem, not the whole a UFO just landed in front of us problem. Now, that typically isn't possible with mystical experiences, though I think that Buddhist enlightenment tests are actually a very fascinating contraindicator for further research in this respect. Further, for the empirical argument to work, we would also have to deal with our post-Kantian situation where most philosophers, yes, I see the speculative realist there in the back, Take it that all of our sensations are conditioned by metaphysical and psychological categories and are thus never immediate as such. We also know that sensation and especially memory are deeply fallible. For this approach to work, we would need an organ of mystical sensation. That's the band name for this episode. We would need to know that this organ isn't subject to the same kinds of problems of being theory laden. Recall, mystical experiences are immediate or at least non-mediated, and it does not fail like other sense organs or memory, or that such failures could be corrected for. Well, the first requirement, an organ of mystical sensation, is actually present in many cultures, such as the soul, the active and passive intellect, the third eye, etc. Just what those organs are, how they might work, and if they're even real, are philosophical and scientific questions for another day. But I want to point them out as at least making a kind of mystical empiricism, well, possible. As we've seen though, requirement two does not seem to be met here. Mystical experiences simply don't interpret themselves, and such interpretations are always mediated at some point by the metaphysical, cultural, and religious filters of the mystic. Lastly, the prospects for a correction process seem bleak given the ineffability and transience characteristics of the mystical experience mentioned earlier. Though 
I will say that there is at least some evidence for mystical experimentalism in history, and that would be a fascinating line of research. Indeed, I think Aleister Crowley touted Thelema along these exact lines as, quote, the method of science and the aim of religion. And, well, maybe appealing to the discourse of science is actually the problem here. More on that in just a second. So empiricism seems to have at least some advantages at first, but as we can see, the sensations of the mystic while they can perhaps tell us that an experience has certainly happened, they can't vouchsafe the veridicality of that experience, much less the truth values of the propositions that flow from it. While this isn't a total blind alley, there are some serious problems to face and not, to my mind, have been overcome by historical mystics. So let's try something else. Now, at this point, you might be saying, hey, this is unfair. You're using enlightenment categories which prioritize skepticism, verification, and falsification. Well, falsification was never on the table as even possible. So notice I just didn't even much knock on that door precisely out of my attempt to be as sympathetic to the claims of mystics as possible. If we want full-on pauperian falsification on this problem, not that that's what scientists actually do, we wouldn't have even gotten this problem into the ring. But let's reframe the conversation away from so-called enlightenment categories. I say so-called because Buddhism, for instance, has some of the most rigorous history of logical analysis for such claims that predate the European enlightenment by centuries and in a wholly other context. The idea that the West is more logical and rational and that the East is more mystical and emotional just isn't true. And honestly, it just plays into all kinds of Orientalist racist stereotypes. Regardless, let's go with a non-skeptical approach. For instance, Swinburne's so-called principle of credulity which states that one should accept a mystical or religious claim unless one can demonstrate that the experiences themselves were based on some unreliable mechanism or it's overridden by other considerations that defeat the claim. So one might imagine a Catholic provisionally accepting a vision of the Virgin Mary unless they found out that the person who had said vision was no high on PCP at the time, or that the vision of the Virgin included urging people to worship Marduk or something. Now, the philosophical naturalist has an obvious criticism here. Don't all these mystical claims have in common both these conditions? Unreliable mechanisms, for instance, the human brain, which we know is profoundly limited and prone to all kinds of failures for which it struggles to internally correct for, and overriding criticisms, the mountain of contradictions produced by the mystics over the centuries. Just how is one supposed to stop the principle of credulity from being a principle of just believing what any so-called mystic claims, as long as it lines up with what you already believe or you want to believe? It seems to easily become a principle of gullibility, especially when socially or communally reinforced. You could ask those folks in Heaven's Gate. Now, yeah, you can't ask them because they killed themselves to get on board a spaceship in the tale of a comet in 1997. Credulity is a hell of a drug. Further, all of this leads to begging the question. We want to know upon what criteria such mystical beliefs should be based, and we're told that it should be based on what seems believable given the relatively weak fail-safes of reliability and other overriding considerations which seem to both already be met, if the naturalists are right, and are sufficiently vague that they could never be satisfied, well, if cult leaders have their way.
the so-called principle of credulity, which did in fact seem to be in effect in a great many traditional societies in the past and is alive and well today, does seem to suffer from some serious philosophical problems. Not to mention occasional mass suicides and killing other people to go to heaven or you just can't kill them because they're already dead or just a bunch of skandhas or whatever. At this point, I think the noetic quality and content of mystical experiences seems deeply, maybe even fundamentally undecidable. We don't seem to know if it's veridical and it's a strong possibility that we can't know. This would render the contemporary concept of unverified personal gnosis, UPG, doubly redundant. Now, if it remains undecidable, that likely jeopardizes its overall value. Though that does seem a very responsible philosophical spot to land, to simply withhold judgment, the good old epoche of ancient skepticism. We don't know, we can't know, and trying to know, much less acting as if you do know, will probably lead to all kinds of problems. So a totally respectable position at this point would be to fundamentally withhold assent to any claims of mystical origin. Though this produces a strange, maybe even paradoxical state of affairs. Mystical experiences are noetic, but that very noetic quality is philosophically useless because of its fundamentally undecidable character. You can see why mystically inclined people can't abide the hands-off skepticism here, intellectually most responsible or not. The prize just seems too good, and it would be. Immediate fundamental truths about reality are rad. They're rad to the max. So let's press this discussion further. What are some other options? Another approach to settle this issue would be knowing that the noetic data can be compared, that the contradictions could be alleviated, and that the truth of some of the mystical claims could be successfully adjudicated. The major hurdle to the first problem, of course, is the embeddedness of mystical claims within cultural, historical, linguistic, and philosophical webs of meaning construction. For a certain kind of radical epistemological relativist, or even for some structuralists, such truths are actually created in those systems or webs of meaning, and the propositional content cannot be extracted without it being destroyed. Of course, a truly radical noetic relativist can just believe whatever they want, but they would have joined the folks that have gotten off the logic train back near the start of our exploration. It seems that insofar as mystics make propositionally similar claims and that we are rigorous in the details, then those should count as viable philosophical comparanda. Okay, now what to do with those pesky contradictions? Now, just to be clear, this is a completely modern problem. Classical mystics were happy to accept true mystical differences and, as I mentioned earlier, furiously argued and even killed each other over those differences. That we want to alleviate these contradictions in this weird ecumenical let's, let's all be friends mode is probably just revelatory of a liberal bias around values like multiculturalism that most of us modern people have. Now, that being a bias doesn't make it wrong necessarily, but it is a bias. Historically, mystics didn't have this problem. Modern people, at least some of them, do. So what are some solutions? Well, there are kind of two. The first is just mystical relativism. The various mystics are just taking various paths up the same mountain, or they're all blind people touching various parts of the same elephant or what have you. Now, I know that the elephant metaphor is rather ancient, but historically, did it really lead to much in the way of true ecumenicalism? No, not really. The truth is one, but the sages know it as many is a great saying, 
But did such a live and let live situation really thrive on the ancient Indian subcontinent? No, just ask the Buddhists. Also ask the Rohingya about Buddhist live and let live ecumenicalism these days, or look into how the Lamas ruled ancient Tibet. The Christians and Muslims, of course, just never really pretended to much in the way of ecumenicalism in history, and neither do religious settlers in Palestine now. Philosophy means everyone's a target. Again, I think that a sufficiently liberal relativism so distorts the original mystical propositions and goes against precisely the capital T truths most mystics claim to have found that this just strikes me as appropriating historical people to a liberal multicultural agenda rather than taking them seriously on their own terms, whether we like those terms or not, especially if we don't like those terms. Clearly there is some spectrum here, and being systematic in this seems key, but I don't want to even think about how many fake, feel-good, roomy quotes I've seen. The second potential solution is something like perennialism or perhaps traditionalism, where the various contradictions or gaps in our knowledge for the reconstructionists out there orbit around a core esoteric philosophy for which mystics are thought to have had historical access, even if only through a glass darkly to crib the Apostle Paul. For this position to work, you would have to develop a criterion, and to be philosophically rigorous it would have to be a non-arbitrary one, which seems rather challenging, but race, nation, even genetics, etc., have all been foot forward by traditionalists and, well, fascists, because that's not terrifying at all, to settle on the specific exoteric beliefs which point the way to the esoteric beliefs which are in fact perennial, given all the philosophical problems we've mentioned thus far. Needless to say, most lists of perennial philosophical truths that I've seen look very unlike what historical mystics actually said, and a lot like what 19th and 20th century traditionalists and perennialists wanted them to say. It just seems to me that relativism often becomes intellectually lazy or downright disingenuous, um, you know, all those fake roomy quotes, and perennialism or traditionalism seem to basically kick the can down the road or just make stuff up. Here's looking at you, the Kabbalion. That may not be inherently wrong, all religions were made up at some point, but calling it perennial or traditional just seems, seems pretty ironic. Well, how might we know that we've settled any side of these problems? Well, I don't think logic alone is going to do the trick here, and I just want to point out how far I'm willing to go in my sympathy for this project, even putting logic into conversation with other criteria strikes me as deeply philosophically compromised, but here we are. Welcome to compromising your core values time. We would need to have some criterion by which to universally assess one set of mystical propositions against the others. At least that might give us a clue as to what mystical experience and by extension the noetic content is viable, or at least least wrong. So mystical survival could be a criterion. Maybe mystical schools are doctrinal systems based on such mystical schools that have endured the longest have done so because they have been, I don't know, selected by the gods or God or have endured because they are simply more fit for some other factors. This, however, seems to fly in the face of modern pagan reconstructionism, whose contemporary mystical experiences are extremely meaningful to them and to their communities. Or religions that just got destroyed on the slaughter bench of history to crib Hegel Surely they were all deeply impactful and thought fundamentally true by their adherents in eons past.
Maybe mystical schools and systems that produce the most psychological or emotional well-being. Though religions seem to basically do this at similar levels within some kind of tolerances, but how would we even get a data to make a claim like this? Maybe we could ask the folks in Bhutan. Also, positive psychological and emotional states aren't indicative of the truth of anything. Ask anyone in an organic chemistry class about that. They're suffering a lot for the truth. Maybe the ones that are the richest. That's certainly how the so-called prosperity gospel works, but it's likely just an indicator of how well a doctrinal system performs in arbitrary historical economic systems like capitalism, or from just killing people and taking their stuff. Perhaps which produces the most ethical people. You can imagine that that story looks pretty bleak, and many mystics themselves have used their mystical experiences to justify dreadful social systems like the caste system, a whole big bunch of irrational bigotry and mass murder. Both Hildegard of Bingen and Bernard of Clairvaux were enthusiastic supporters of the Crusades. Frankly, all of these are so fraught with philosophical problems that they make the problem worse. And further, there's no clear line connecting any of these metrics with the fundamental issues here, the mystical experiences and their noetic content. There might be a criterion worth exploring despite all this mess. The analytic philosopher of religion, Alvin Plantiga, has argued that Christians need not justify any foundations upon which their faith rests because human beings have an innate sense of the divine, or a sensus divinitatis, which senses the divine like the eye senses light or the ear senses sound, though clearly not in an empirical fashion. In the same way that I don't need to justify the fact that I'm hearing myself talk, I'm currently listening to myself, neither, perhaps, do religious people need to prove the existence of God nor the noetic qualities of mystical experiences. These are epistemologically properly basic, to use his terminology. It's an innate sense, and those who don't sense God or the divine are, according to him, simply like people who are born blind or deaf. Their sensus divinitatis is simply malfunctioning. Now, the ableism aside, though atheism would be an interesting kind of disability, this has always struck me as biased in the direction of both monotheism and the idea of a personal god. But for Plantiga, that's a future, not a bug. He argues that Christianity is correct because, among all the other religions, the sense of the divine is best suited for it. This is a bit like Augustine's conception of the God-shaped whole, but even more refined. Of course, proving this is another problem, and why shouldn't it be tuned to uh, detect a non-personal god, or perhaps even many gods? Couldn't a pagan or a monist just claim that the Christian sense of the divine is malfunctioning when it detects a personal god, much less a god who was killed or who was humiliated on a cross, etc. Now, this is certainly an interesting theory, and indeed, I've met many people who claim to have just such a sense of the divine or the numinous, but this strikes me as just so vague and biased, at least in the form developed here by Plantiga, that without a lot of further work, this just isn't going to be much help. Finally, let's ask to what degree a mystic might be reasonably justified in accepting their own experiences as veridical and as counting as evidence for supporting further doctrine. By extension, the degree to which a non-mystic may be extended the same courtesy. The answer here seems to be yes, because in a specific social, cultural, or religious system, such experiences always present themselves against the horizon of just that system. Of course it would be reasonable to accept them as explicating and reinforcing that very horizon. 
virtually all of our experiences function in just this way. Now, again, what's reasonable in a certain cultural, historical, or social setting is still no fundamental standard for what's actually true, but that ship may have sailed at this point. Hell, it may have sailed and we were waiting at the bus stop. Regardless, given such a cultural horizon, it does seem rational. Rational here just meaning that making a decision, all things equal, makes sense in a given situation. For instance, gambling in a casino, knowing that you will lose money over time, but having fun is just the unit of analysis here. That's reasonable, even if it's not rational per se. Further, it also seems reasonable for a non-mystic to accept a mystic's experiences as veridical and the noetic content as true in that situation. Though, if one accepts such a state of affairs as grounds for believing when basically no other justifications are available, one should bear in mind a very important caveat. The grounds for belief, recall, are that they are situated in a specific set of beliefs against a certain social horizon that make the noetic content of mystical experiences reasonable to accept or really explicable at all. However, those grounds would also make it reasonable for others to reject your ideas as nonsense or even heresy and maybe even justify them violently persecuting you for your beliefs if such actions are reasonable from their point of view. Further, it also makes the naturalist reasonable in their rejection of all such mystical claims because their criterion of evaluation, methodological skepticism in the scientific method or what have you, simply has no truck with such claims. They can basically deride you as accepting nonsense and calling it religion with just as much legitimacy as you earnestly hold your beliefs to be justified true belief. Further, and this one is really curious, if a mystic emerges in your social system for whom the noetic content of their visions foundationally criticizes the very social system which makes for believing any mystical claims, such mystics are not to be believed, thus rendering mystical innovation basically impossible. The very conditions that allowed for such belief seem to foreclose upon the possibility of religious or mystical innovation. It's no wonder that many religious terms for wrong religious belief are the same for the word for innovation. This would be a pity, of course, because most people interested in mysticism see themselves as countercultural, something belief in mystical noesis may actually have to foreclose upon to exist as such. I'm just not sure many people interested in mystical truths would also be willing to accept this radical kind of conservatism as part of the trade, but that might just be what's in the cards so to speak. So what kind of conclusions might we have reached at this point? Jones lists five that I'll summarize. One, having a mystical experience doesn't guarantee the truth of the verticality of the experience, nor the subsequent noetic content. Two, even if mystical experiences are veridical, there remain real limits of what the mystic can claim to know about those realities. Note that knowledge and mere belief are epistemologically distinct. Experiences don't interpret themselves, and that interpretation always occurs in a culture, in a time, in a religion, etc. Three, because there are no theory-neutral or objective means to evaluate the noetic content of a mystic's experience, we can't know if they are true, so such experiences can't strongly count towards the objective truth of any set of doctrinal claims. And four and five, it seems reasonable for mystics and non-mystics to accept both the veridicality of the experience and the noetic content therein, but only in highly circumspect tolerances.
outside of those tolerances, confidence in both must logically decline rapidly. Those tolerances lead inexorably to a kind of religio, social, or mystical conservatism. This last aspect shouldn't be super surprising to students of the history of mysticism. Mystics have proven to be among the most socially and religiously conservative factions within society, with the exception of a few antinomians, but again, they are the exception that proves the rule. Finally, I think we have to conclude that making a completely rational decision here is probably impossible, but simply giving in to irrationality would be destructive of any conception of truth at all, which contradicts the very desire to seek out mystical truths in the first place. Of course, Rudolf Otto pioneered the concept of the non-rational, where strict logic and irrationalism have a minimal stakehold and certainly no epistemological monopoly, that being the domain of the experience of the numinous. Indeed, I think what's also crucially important to say in all of this is that philosophy and philosophers have done an exceedingly poor job in dealing with mysticism and its claims in recent centuries. And it's in the hopes of forwarding and deepening that discussion that I make this episode dealing with precisely the intersection of philosophy and esotericism both because I find much occult philosophy sorely lacking in the philosophy department, and also I find that philosophy not taking seriously one of the most profound aspects of the human experience, that of mysticism and the mystical. If you're interested in esotericism, hermetic philosophy, or the intersection of mysticism and philosophy more generally, make sure to subscribe and check out my other content on topics in esotericism. Also, if you want to support my work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics in esotericism here on YouTube, I hope that you consider supporting my work on Patreon or with a one-time donation. You can find those links below, and I deeply appreciate your consideration of supporting this project and the channel. This episode is heavily indebted to Richard Jones's philosophy of mysticism, which I think deals with that topic better than most texts out there. His writing is clear, it's free from much in the way of jargon, and he deals with both Eastern and Western mysticism in one breath. In fact, he's an expert in so-called Eastern mysticism. It's a really fine text, and I would recommend it to anyone interested in the intersection of philosophy religion, and mysticism more generally. Of course, I mentioned James's variety of religious experience at the very start of this episode. It's still a perfectly fine text to start, although obviously philosophy of religion has come a long way since then. The classic text on this topic is Stace's Mysticism and Philosophy, but it's unfortunately difficult to find these days and rather expensive when you do find it. For a more phenomenological approach to this problem, the classic text there is going to be Rudolf Otto's The Idea of the Holy. This episode has taken a rather analytic approach to the topic, and I'm sure that I'll come back with a more phenomenological approach, heavily featuring Otto, just to balance things out. Until then, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thanks for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history philosophy, and religion.